Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Mesa Public Library and our presentation about adding shade, color, and wildlife to your gardens. And uh, just to mention that uh, this is being recorded, and if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat, and then if they're not answered during the presentation, uh, we will answer them at the end of the presentation. So thank you very much for attending. And I'm going to introduce Donna DeFrancesco. She is our presenter today. Um, she is a horticulturist and conservation coordinator with the City of Environmental and Sustainability Division. She educates Mesa residents about xeriscape, water conservation, living green, and sustainability. So take it away, Donna. Thank you very much, Stephanie, and thank you to the Mesa Library for hosting uh, these workshops, these lunchtime programs, and it's the uh, Arizona Gardening uh, 101 series that we've been doing the last few months. So welcome to uh, plants to provide shade, color, and wildlife, and you know, I worded it that way because we wanted to talk about uh, plants that are actually going to give you shade. A lot of times, uh, people might get the impression that, that I'm going to give you plants that grow in shade. So I wanted to make sure that was clear. <laughs> and I want to tell you too, that throughout the presentation, I'm going to be showing you a lot of plants. And so uh, just right here on our first slide, we've got Queens wreath. I have the name uh, on the slide so that you can see what plant that is and the scientific name. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. And I picked the Queens wreath because it truly is a plant that can provide shade because we can put it on a trellis and, and have it create shade in our yards or up against our walls. Uh, it certainly provides incredible color. And then of course you can see the bees are loving it here. So we've got a couple little bee friends uh, there in the vine. So well, as we go through, you're gonna see a lot of plants. I'm gonna talk a lot about concepts before I go into some of the plant information specifics. So, um, the other thing I wanted to mention as we get started, and you can either take a picture of this, uh, we are going to send out everything, anybody that's registered, if we have your email, we're going to send a recording to you after the program, and I'm going to send you a link that's going to get you to a page that has all this information, so it'll have these links for you that'll be really easy to get to. So you'll find how to order some of our uh, landscape or xeriscape booklets online. We have a uh, grass to Xeriscape incentive, you can get $575. You can learn about that. You can learn about my e-newsletters. I have one about how to water properly and one about living green events like this, how to hire a professional, rainwater harvesting, composting. We have a composting program. So there's all kinds of links that are gonna get you directly to this information, pruning, fixing leaks, and the SRP shade tree program. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. So you can use this little bit.ly uh, URL that's at the bottom, or like I said, we're going to send this to you as well with this same link uh, after the program. So here's what we're going to zoom through. Uh, we're going to talk about what do you want to plant? And I'll, I'll, you know, when I talk about that, I'm saying, do you want to plant color? Do you want to plant shade? Or do you want to plant wildlife? So what is it you want to plant? Or maybe you want all three. Uh, we're going to go through that uh, you're not in Kansas anymore. Should you be from Kansas <laughs> or other parts of the country? Uh, planting and selection considerations. Then I'll give you kind of a plant photo montage. We'll go through a little bit of maintenance and my favorite plant selection resources. All right, what do you want to plant? What is it you want in your yard? We're gonna be, we have booklets and things where we feature uh, over 200 plants. And I'm gonna you know, show you this booklet in a little bit and the website also that goes, that, that is uh, the online version. But we have incredible plants that grow here beautifully, that thrive here. And so we're gonna be featuring all of those that, that real, and I'm going to definitely be highlighting my favorites, okay? So um, you're going to see a lot of Donna favorites <laughs> in this presentation. But again, shade, color, or wildlife, there's a beautiful uh, Perry's agave in the photo. Okay, so let's start with planting shade. Reason why we want to plant shade is to cool your yard, cool your home, 
cool. Maybe cool the places you park your car. <laughs> we know we seek that out in the parking lots around here. Um, and then know your seasonal sun exposure and make sure you don't forget we want the winter sun. So that's where we get into uh, whether it's deciduous or evergreen. We'll talk about that in a minute as well. Uh, Stephanie provided a great compliment to me at the beginning of the program. She said she wanted to sit in that chair. And that's my backyard. You can see that that just is, you know, we want to create these shady retreats. It's under a tree. You can see it's shaded and just um, it does provide that just that that nicer environment. And I just want to show just some gorgeous shade pictures. This is at Scottsdale Xeriscape Demonstration Garden. Uh, it's out there near Indian Bend. You should look it up if you haven't been there. Um, and these are those palabreas and just what beautiful. I love these trees because they almost look like human arms and legs and they have, like they look like they have muscles on them. So they're just a beautiful tree. Uh, and then this is uh, this is actually the hybrid Palo Verde, and I'm going to, um, I might as well talk about it right now. I, I actually uh, don't recommend this tree, and it has some incredible, beautiful attributes. You can see it right here. It provides really nice shade. It's thornless. That's why everybody loves it. And it is a hybrid of the, uh, the Mexican Palo Verde and the Little Leaf, and I forget what they back cross it with, but it's, it's so it's, it's crossed with, with different species of Palo Verdes. What they came up with, like I said, is a thornless tree. It's got beautiful bark. It blooms throughout. It's not just like a one bloom period. It blooms throughout the summer. The problem with this tree is it gets a lot of limb breakage. And especially with these winds, oh my gosh, the winds we had, we were just talking about that at the beginning of the program. They really can get, um, they just don't last very long. It's, it's unfortunate. So I kind of uh, recommend not getting this tree and if you do have it just don't overwater it and that'll help strengthen it a little bit all right so conserving energy with shade you're that's the that's typically the point as you're you're wanting to cool the environment but conserving energy in your home is really important so uh the, the biggest place that we use energy the biggest time is summertime here where we have to keep those air conditioners cranking and it has been shown with studies that were done at University of Arizona that you can get a 24 to 42% reduction just by placing plants strategically around your home. Oh, okay. And so here's, you know, here's an example of a tree that is in front of these windows and in front of this entryway that you can tell this is early spring because we have brittle bush and, and blooming. And, um, and this is a mesquite that's semi-deciduous so it's lost a lot of its leaves so it's allowing in the winter sun but that should be leafing out just within months and it's going to provide great shade there uh the study even showed you know people say oh grass provides cooling well, grass does provide cooling you know right there at the surface and in a little bit of cooling it said grass can even cool your home by about four percent but it's really the strategic placement and getting that shade on the home that makes a difference so again most of our money spent um, to cool our homes. Um, the, that cooling of the air around the home can be done not only with trees, but shrubs and all kinds of other things. And of course, you know, the cooler air increases our human comfort. The other thing, we just need trees really to, to, to cool down our urban environments and our cities. So, so we really always want to promote that planting trees. So when it comes to figuring out where to get the best uh, cooling for the summertime and where to place the trees you you know west the west side of the home is the best uh the east side is kind of the next best place to be uh, placing the trees um on the south side you can get some benefits but you want to make sure you're planting the deciduous trees there so that they do lose their if that means they're going to lose their leaves in the winter time and the sun can come through and then um north isn't really a critical thing as far as saving energy around your home, but you might want to think about your neighbors because if you're planting on the north side, that might impact your neighbor's south side of their home, for example, or depending on the configuration. This just shows that exposure that we get of in the different times of the year. And so the winter months, you know how that sun just gets really low to the south. You know, we're north of the equator, so the, the sun is always a little bit to the south. Um, you can see here, it's not like just if we were on the equator, it would be straight up and down, right? So it's uh, even the summer sun is, is, you know, leans a little bit to the south. So you can see that depending on the time of year, 
um, the, the sun is coming up at a slightly different location and setting and so forth. And it kind of moves back and forth as we go through the summer and winter solstice periods. Now, one of the things, um, if we had solar on this roof, <laughs> that is why we typically put solar on the south side, because that is going to be typically your best exposure where the sun's always towards the south. Um, so keep that in mind. Now, there's a lot more to this that I am not going to explain, but I did want to um, talk remind you the SRP shade tree program is available to all SRP uh, electric customers. They have a program coming up on September 8th. It's the last program for the season. If you go through their, uh, I think it's just a one or two hour program, then you can sign up to get two free trees and go. they'll be distributing them this fall. So um, in that program, there's a great instructor and he goes through this in great detail. So please take advantage of that if you can. So other considerations, like I mentioned, deciduous versus evergreen. Again, deciduous means it's going to drop those leaves in the winter months. And then evergreen means it's just green year round. So keep that in mind as far as um, deciding what you're placing where. You know, if you really want to get some of that winter sunshine, again, make sure you're selecting those deciduous trees. And I'll show you a few. Uh, many plants can provide shade. And I mentioned that a little bit earlier too, but consider things like your vines that can definitely provide great shade and keep that wall cooler. If you're taking the sun that's beating on a wall and, and, it, and it's hitting this plant first, that's gonna keep that wall much cooler for you and have less transfer of heat into your home. So, you know, we have those 115 to 120 degree days, you know, we really get a lot of heat that gets into our, our homes there. Okay, shade conflicts. So with each of the different topics we're talking about, I'm gonna go into conflicts. And I, I tried to find a better word, but I thought, no, it really is. Sometimes you just have to consider these other things. Now, this, is, this example is, is a little over the top. And obviously I think, I suspect what happened here is this tree probably came up as a seedling or maybe it was coming up in another pot. I doubt they planted an ash tree in this planter, <laughs> but, but, and, um, uh, but obviously it's not the right tree for the right place. You don't, you know, because we're planting these trees to shade a window or the, the side of the home or something, we want to be careful that we give that tree plenty of room to grow and yet still provide that shade. So just make sure you're selecting the right tree uh, and that you're placing it in the right location so it has a chance to grow. Usually you take the, let's say the tree gets 30 feet in diameter, cut that in half and that would be 15 feet and don't put that plant any closer than about 15 feet next to a structure. So you always want to be careful about structures, fences, your neighbors and, and you know, sidewalks and your driveway, you know, you just need to consider those things. Um, and, and, and again, uh, the, the second bullet there was make sure you uh, allow some of that sun in for the winter months. So let's look at planting color. And when we plant color, it, I want you to get creative. Think about all these different ways. You know, it can be just foliage. It can be, um, it could be, of course, the flowers is what we immediately think of, but there's seed pods and fruit. And then there's the seasonal color. So we want to talk about that. And, you know, there's lots of designers that are great at just saying, you know, let's get you color year round. So we'll, we'll plant this because it blooms, you know, from November to January. And then you know, kicking off into late January, we'll have this other plant that'll give you a bloom period for another couple months. And, and with seasonal color, you, you know, by selecting those plants carefully, you can get a uh, great year round color. So keep that in mind as well. So looking at the, at the foliage, there's, there, here's a great example, the Chinese pistache. And this is a particular cultivar called red push. Um, and these are the leaves and why it's called red push is the young growth that is emerging out has kind of this reddish bronzy color. So it, it gives you some really nice visual interest. Stephanie and I were talking at the beginning of the, uh, before the program, and we were saying how we missed some of the trees were both from in the Northeast. And, you know, I miss those red maples and, you know, some of those other things that give you a little more color. Of course, the fall color, my gosh, this is the best thing I have found for that fall color in Arizona. And it's this Chinese pistache. And this is right outside our Idea Museum. And this was a beautiful fall when those had turned color. And uh, they are deciduous. They will lose those leaves. 
Uh, and they will even have little berries. So they even have some fruiting bodies that are interesting as well. So think about those things. Of course, you can grow things like pomegranate and pomegranate will not only provide you this, this fruiting body, which is the fruit that you can eat. So something edible, so that's even better. Uh, and then things like, um, also with color, I want you to think about, this is really showing the pods here, but what I really wanted to show with the Texas ebony is that dark green. It is one of the best plants for that nice dark green color because a lot of our desert plants have you know more of this gray color uh, full uh, uh, leaf and so um, again we get we can get a lot of color in our landscapes just with what what shades of green that we that we have in there I even did a blog for water use it wisely that was shades of green I did it I think it was for St. Patrick's Day and we um, talked about I'm going to show you a few I'll bring it back up when I show you one of the plants and uh, but it was just fun to kind of look at those plants that give you those beautiful green colors. This is a great little shrub called firecracker bush or Hamelia patens. And I just love that it's just, I just thought I wanted to show you just something that is that flower color. You know, you just have uh, some yellow bells it looks like in the background. And, uh, but what a beautiful uh, green leafy plant with that bright orange. So it's a great, great plant. And then, of course, the more flowers. Let's look at those yellow bells, which will give us color from spring to fall. This is talking a little bit more about that seasonality. And then something like Texas mountain laurel, late winter to early spring, typically around, I've seen it bloom anywhere between December and February. A lot of times it's near, it blooms near Valentine's Day period, somewhere in there. Um, it is very, unfortunately, this bloom does not last a whole long time, but it is so beautiful. To me, it's like if you knew lilacs or something back, back where you're from or wisteria, it kind of has that look. It has an incredible scent. It's also like, it smells like a juicy fruit gum, grape knee high soda. It's really interesting. Uh, and then again, nice dark green leaf and no thorns. So it, it is a really fun shrub. And if you grow it long enough period of time, it'll turn into a small tree for you. So it's a, it's a real nice little plant. And then things like, again, fruits and pods and berries. And so this is just the mesquite pods. Uh, of course, the beautiful red uh, prickly pear fruits. This is what they make, you know, prickly pear syrup and all those things that you see that are bright red. That's real natural color. And, um, and then this is Lycium. Uh, it's a great little wildlife plant and it has these pretty little, they're very tiny flowers, little tiny fruit, but it attracts birds like crazy. They love that plant. Wolfberry is the common name. All right, I'm showing some of my tree hugging. Uh, it's true, I'm a tree hugger. This is, <laughs> speaking of back east, this is in New Hampshire, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And I think it was the John P Paul Jones house. And they were saying this, birch tree had been there I think he planted it and birch trees never last that long so they were uh saying what a re remarkable tree it was so of course I had to hug it and I, I do miss birch trees um but here's a couple of our desert trees that provide again very similar I love the Palo Blanco and I'm going to show you a little bit more actually I want to read you something so this is a book by um it's called uh, it's it's Mary Irish <laughs> Mary Irish is the author, and it's called Gardening in the Desert, A Guide to Plant Selection. This book, all the plant books have pictures, right? This book has no, well, I guess it has a couple pictures, but not, they're black and white, not very much. But her writing is so wonderful, and it will take you there. It will, it will bring the vis visual to you. So what, what Mary says is on this Palo Blanco that I'm talking about, the bark is charming. It is white, hence the name, Palo Blanco, means white stick. And great sheets of it peel off regularly, like the pages of an ancestral scroll revealing the secrets of the bark beneath. I just thought that was a beautiful description <laughs> of that bark. And again, it adds some interest and things to your landscape. Uh, and then, of course, we have the Palo Verde, which is green, means green stick. And Palo Verdes have that green bark. That green bark allows it to photosynthesize. So uh, just some fun things that you can include. Here's a plant. I've had this in, uh, this isn't from picture from my yard, but I have had this in my yard for over 15 years and hardly do anything to it, but it, it's called yellow orchid vine. It's these really beautiful clusters of flowers. The cool part is it gets these papery chartreuse colored pods 
afterwards. And you can see that it can all be on the plant all at the same time. So the flowers, the pod, and this is a dried out pod. They, and so sometimes it's called a butterfly vine because doesn't that look like a butterfly right there? Um, so it is just a really neat vine that offers all kinds of color and interest uh, depending on what's going on. And then it's, when, you, when you go for color, don't forget, to, now this might be like, whoa, whoa, that's color. <laughs> but um, so you don't have to go this vibrant, uh, although it's beautiful. And I love that, you know, you can just take and paint one of your walls on the inside, you know, the HOA can't do anything about that. So you can paint the interior, interior of your walls, do a beautiful color that's going to really make the plants pop. And especially, you know, pick the plants then that really are going to be a good contrast to that. But I just think they did a beautiful job um, with the combination here. It looks like there's uh, desert marigolds. And um, this is, I think, one of the verbenas that's growing here that looks just, it's the same color as the wall. So nicely done. Now, color conflicts, what are you going to have? Uh, litter, seasonal pruning that you're going to have to do, and maybe too many hummingbirds like that's a problem, right? Because then they're fighting all the time. <laughs> no, I just put that in to be smart aleck. So I wanted to show you this particular uh, plant, though, which is Datura. And it is uh, basically a wildflower in my yard. I, I seed wildflower seeds all the time, and I think that's how it starts coming up. Once it comes up in your yard, it will usually reseed itself. I did not plant that here in this location in my yard. <laughs> I had it in the backyard in the desert landscape area. And um, this one just came up and it just shaped itself beautifully. And look at this bloom, it's just amazing. Now these bloom predominantly through the evening and early morning. You can see kind of there's like a little carpenter bee here trying to work on it. The scent is like lily of the valley, it's just delightful and it'll attract a lot of uh, moths and things like that to, to pollinate it as well. So so it's gorgeous. Well then a few weeks later I had to come out here you can see the the flowers kind of droop and pop off and then it produces a seed head. Um, so I had to sweep that up. Just want you to be aware of that. So keep that in mind when you're um, if you've got a lot of color. Uh, plant wildlife. Let's talk about that. So we want to make sure we have plants that are going to attract them in one way or another and typically that's going to be food plants but we also can attract them with our plant material by providing them shelter. Uh, water sources are going to be critical so if you do want to bring wildlife in it's nice if you have some type of little bird bath or something like that for them and then um, just make sure you're following wildlife friendly landscape tips. You don't want to be using insecticides, pesticides of uh, if you can help it or just be very cautious how you use them. So this is, um, we have these interpretive signs up over at Mesa Community College. And um, it's one of those things that, that the, um, just kind of some basics. And so again, we talked about having the food sources, talked about having shelter, because that's going to be really critical, especially during some of the rough weather events and things like that. But they also need places to hide from predators. Um, and then again some some of the water sources you want to make sure we don't forget the pollinators pollinators are so important and they can be bats and bees and moths and other insects so when we think of bees as our pollinators but birds all kinds of things are pollinators and then um you know wildlife friendly landscape tips allow your plants to go to seed because you know things like uh, desert marigold if you let them go to seed and just leave them and don't get too uh aggressive about having to cut them back as soon as they finish blooming, the birds will come in and, and they love that seed on the seed heads. So by doing those kinds of things, it's it's uh, very beneficial for the, for the birds and other wildlife. Let the lower branches uh, extend to the ground. That provides better shelter. Uh, use organic methods, of course, um, and tolerate the insects. That's all part of the whole you know, animal web, food web, <laughs> and leaving litter in place. I'm giving you a really good excuse to not be out there raking up all the time. So consider that. And then consider different stages of the, the fauna, the bugs and other things, especially with bugs, may need different food plants. So we know that caterpillars feed on certain plants. It could be different than what the adult butterflies feed on. They have completely different mouth parts. They have chewing mouth parts when they're a caterpillar and they siphoning like a little straw mouth part where they just 
drink nectar when they're an adult. So we have to think about that. If you're wanting to attract certain butterflies, you have to look up and see what they uh, what they like to eat. Typically, the larvae are very specific to certain foods, maybe a, a variety on some cases and others, it might be very exclusive. So you need to just look that up. This was a fun little poster they had at Desert Botanical Garden many years ago. And that's me and that's my boss who was here at the time. <laughs> so uh, this is what we want to do this for, right? We This is this was a, uh, a Palo Brea tree out in front of one of our buildings and it's beautiful mother uh, hummingbird making her nest. You can see uh, she's still got nesting material in her mouth, so she's still building it. One of the if you want a really good reason why black widows are good, you can see she has collected and used a lot of webbing to make her nest. And they do use that. Well, the wonderful thing that they know about spider webbing is it stretches. And so after they, you know, have their put their eggs in there and they hatch out and those little, little baby hummingbirds get larger, that that nest can stretch out. It also provides incredible strength to keep it in place. So uh, so that's a, a good reason for spiders. And of course, you know, we love to attract birds. This is just a dove hiding in an ebony tree. And of course, the, the red yucca, uh, it's a little verdant on a red yucca. And the butterflies, again, these are great pollinators. And these are all photos I took. These two are in my backyard. This is a little orchid tree with a giant swallowtail. This is the mist flower, and this is a queen butterfly. And this is a painted lady. This is actually a San Verbena in Yuma. I mean, I, when we went out there one year after the rains. Yuma has these beautiful sandy areas that just burst into bloom when they get good rains. And uh, just, just some beautiful things that you can see. And of course the bees, we know we need to do a lot more for the bees. When bees are busy and collecting nectar and pollen, they don't care about you. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the cautions we need to take with bees, but please, please, you know, be appreciative that the bees are visiting your plants. We definitely need them to be in our gardens to pollinate our, our vegetable crops. We're not gonna get squash and tomatoes and all kinds of things if we don't have healthy bees to help pollinate. Now. You're going to think I'm crazy because I, I go a little overboard, but I also love, this is like the carpenter bee, and you see those around. The carpenter bees can be very uh, territorial. They'll come up to you, and you think they're being aggressive, but they're kind of just flying in your face, and they're like, this is my spot, you need to leave, and pretty much you listen to it because they're pretty big and you don't want to be bothered. I've never known anyone to get stung by one of these. I'm sure you can. They can sting, but they're not they're not coming after you. They just are saying, you know, hey, you know, move on. Uh, and then this one is called a tarantula hawk wasp, and it is on a milkweed flower bud. Now, the confusing part is, is this milkweed has little aphids all over it. Aphids aren't a problem. They get on the, the milkweeds it's early in the spring and it's okay and it helps get beneficial bugs and all that going. But um, the, this tarantula hawk wasp is actually feeding on the nectar of the flowers. Um, what they do is they will, uh, they do, they're called tarantula hawks because they do eat tarantulas <laughs> and other spiders. So they will capture a spider, uh, they will, stun it by stinging it, they will um, place it in a little burrow and that the, the egg inside will grow in the spider and emerge out as a new wasp. So when these things though are getting the nectar again, they are so intent on that, they will not bother you. Now they can sting and it can be extremely painful. So you wanna be careful, but if you leave it alone, it's gonna leave you alone. So again, I just wanna warn you, I think they're beautiful. I think it's as beautiful as watching a hummingbird coming in, but I know I'm a little bit strange. Now, I probably just really overboard with this picture. I shouldn't show the snake, but you know, we do get other wildlife that comes in uh, with the rains. I've heard a lot of people mention they're seeing frogs. I hope those of you out there are seeing frogs. The little ground squirrels are always fun and, and they'll be out there as well. Sometimes it's not gophers. Gophers are the ones that cause all the holes. And we don't want gophers. Uh, the snake was actually, and I think it's just a gopher snake, if I believe, was out at our household hazardous materials facility recently. <laughs> so, uh, but sometimes we can get some of these other wildlife. And then again, I'm a little weird. I just found this beautiful praying mantis in my backyard. This is a little, my mist flower plant. It, you could see it was after the rains and look at, he even looked at me for the picture. I was like, yeah. Uh, but again, these are beneficial. 
um, and just fun to see that these other things are happening in your yard. Uh, it's wonderful things to observe and get the kids out there to observe them. It's, it's a lot of fun. Then you got things like maybe Palo Verde beetles out there. And again, you know, you don't, uh, I know many of you'd rather not there, you know, they can be three, three inches uh, in, in length. And so very intimidating, but they're very short lived. Again, it's part of our nature, our nature here. And just, you know, if you're not spraying pesticides and all, and hopefully you're not, these things are, it's just their natural life cycle uh, and they're not gonna harm you. They barely harm the plants. So they're really nothing to worry about. So the conflicts, um, you know, what don't you want to attract? There's a lot of sightings people have here of coyotes and that kind of thing. So obviously when it comes to wildlife, there's certain things we, we don't want to um, have coming into our yards possibly. I know in Tucson and stuff, they have javelinas coming in and that can be very destructive. So there's things like that. Uh, then there's the natural food chain. So again, coyotes coming in and things, things, uh, you know, we had a rabbit that came in and lived in our yard for a while and we knew that would attract uh, other things. And then if you have cats, well, first of all, if you have cats, you don't want the coyotes there, but we have to make sure if we do have cats that we're not attracting birds and then the cats are killing the birds. So make sure you put, you know, collars with bells and stuff like that. And then just remember that wildlife isn't always tidy, you know, so, so we got to consider those things. Um, uh, actually, let me show you this one first. I wanted to show you, you know, there's things like I, we call it like bird poop season because we get in the spring, everything's flowering, everything, and the birds are starting, you know, they're all, you know, doing what, you know, birds do in the spring and <laughs> then they start nesting. And then we just start seeing all these bird droppings everywhere, right? So this is on top of my uh, uh, mailbox. And, uh, but man, there's some there's some droppings that we see that are like, whoa, what were they eating? <laughs> My neighbor grows all these mulberry trees and I think since they get into their mulberries. But I wanted to show this picture. This is my backyard. So I'm a horticulturist. My husband's a horticulturist. We hired a good friend of ours, a master gardener and a horticulturist and a designer. We had a guy that does all these landscaping and he installed it. None of us, none of us, this is a terrible confession none of us thought about the fact that there's power lines. I'm in historic downtown Mesa. I have power lines above this bench. My neighbor right behind this wall feeds his birds. And then you probably can guess the rest. This is a built-in bench, so I can't move it. <laughs> so essentially it gets a lot of the bird droppings. And so you just need to think about, make sure you're thinking about those types of things. Okay. Next, we're gonna talk about, you're not in Kansas anymore. And I, I, uh, I took this picture on June 14th before we got all these rains and we were in that kind of 115 plus temperatures and the fires were going and it just was like hot, hot, hot. We were worried we were gonna see another summer like last year, um, but we do live in a place of, of, of the Sonoran Desert. It has little rainfall. We have typically, not right now, but typically very low humidity, that high heat and those high temperatures. Uh, but again, we get really cold winter temperatures too. We get frosts here. So we got to think about that. We have those extremes. We do have those high winds. Oh my gosh, like we had the other night. I was just so worried about all the trees. And I know we lost a lot of trees, unfortunately, because sometimes those winds are so strong. It's just really nothing uh, that can be done about that. And then manipulated landscapes just means that we're planting things, we're putting them on irrigation and that kind of thing. But, you know, again, we do live in the Sonoran Desert. You know, this is up South Mountain, Saguaros and, and Little Leaf Palo Verdes looking down into the Phoenix area. And, and But here we're in a, uh, because of the way we have our homes and plant our yards, we have up to 70% of our household water used in the landscape. So, you know, this is something that we need to consider. Uh, I wanna show you these drought monitor maps and I'm actually showing you, I should have, let's see, it's August. Yeah, so here's the latest, but I'm gonna show you July 6th. So this was last month and this is a great map to go to just Google drought monitor and you'll find it. And it's showing you what's going on across the country. And so you can see that um, as of last month, it is showing, uh, and actually I shoot, I cut the scale off here, I'm sorry. But the, the dark burgundy means it's the highest uh, extreme drought. Um, and then the bright red is severe. And then as it gets gold to tan to yellow, it's, it's, it's lower intensity of drought. So um, 
what we're seeing right now is, is of course, you know, that was in June, it was even a little bit more on the, the dark red. And then in, in July, we saw the brighter red coming in, showing that it wasn't quite as bad because we started getting rains. And then getting into August, you can see, and here's the moderate and abnormal, um, showing those lighter colors. And so you can see it's really changed. Now, what you do see is we're still seeing the really dark red, especially along the Colorado River. And so that is something that you probably, many of you probably heard about. It was just announced this past Monday. Uh, the Bureau of Reclamation uh, did a study the, looking ahead, looking with all their projections, and they, they have determined that the lake will be uh, at a low, you know, a overly low level. And, and then they have uh, declared a tier one drought shortage. Uh, and it's going to mean cuts to the Colorado River that is being distributed in our state. Uh, that'll be specifically to agriculture starting in January of 2022. So the announcement was made Monday. It is warning everybody that that's likely to go into effect on January of 2022. It is a very serious situation. We, it is not unexpected. This is something that, that's been monitored and everyone's been watching and everyone's been planning for. The cities have really done a good job in securing our water supplies. We want to, you know, stress with everyone that we have many different sources of water. Of course, the Salt River Project system that is in our state that we uh, get a lot of our water from. We have groundwater stored. We've uh, used our reclaimed water that goes through our water treatment plants. So there's a, a this will not impact municipal water uh, for this, at least in 2022. And but we'll have to go from there and see what happens. And so this is an interesting comparison, especially with seeing all this rain, there's hydrological droughts, which means that it's just not raining, and it's impacting right where we're at. And then there's um, uh, the climate, climatological, let me see if I got that right. No, we're the, I'm sorry, the, with the weather, it's the climatological drought that we're, that you can have if you just don't have the rains. And then the hydrological drought is when our reservoirs or our water supplies are impacted. And in this case, that's what we're having with the Colorado. So I know it seems a little odd that it's like, oh, it's raining like crazy, but it's the Colorado River system is still, um, is, is still very short on water. The other thing I want to show is just these crazy temperatures. So this again is uh, just showing from 1896 to 2020, and it's showing the number of days of that we had temperatures throughout that year greater than 110. And you can see it definitely is a line, 1896 to 2020, that it is climbing, right, as, as we're going through time. So we see that we have our, our area is heating up. But the other thing that's crazy here is this 2020 number of over 50 that we had that record breaking heat last year of over 110. We had over 50 days over 110 and look at how much that just shattered any other records we had on that. So that's why it was just so shocking last year what happened. And you know, the other thing that happens is we have that heat gets held by our cities and our urban environments and our concrete and our buildings and our streets and our roads. And that's why we need more trees and more shading and more thoughtfulness of how we're, we're building our cities. But what happens is that it, all those surfaces heat up, they hold the temperature and then they um, release it slowly at night so things don't cool off quickly. And it holds those nighttime temperatures up really high as well. Uh, again, this is showing the nighttime temperature greater than 75. And this is over time. And again, you can see it trending up, but that's just 75. The real impact on plants is when it's over 90. And look at this graph again, 1896 to 2020. And you can see it basically was flatlined. We never had temperatures over 90 at night until about the 70s. And we had little blips in the, in the 30s, which might have been from the Dust Bowl. Uh, and then it just again, 2020 just shattered those records. So we kind of see these things happening and we see that this is tough on our plants. So um, that's why I want to get into these planting and selection considerations and why we're really stressing those desert plants. So, you know, broadly we define our plants being drought resistant. So they're, they, um, that means they have a they have features that allow them to survive without water in some way or another. Some of them might escape the dry periods, and so they might have their life cycles during 
the wetter periods, like right now, there might be stuff that grows this time of year, like senna's that like to grow in the summertime and bloom. But then when it dries up, they'll they'll go to seed. Uh, there's drought avoiders and, and savers, which kind of store the water. And then those that are just very tolerant and they just endure uh, low water amounts. So, so this, we have a game. How do those plants survive? And so, so the wildflowers are a great example of just avoiding the dry periods. And typically these spring wildflowers, you, you get seed out there, or maybe there's a seed there and they'll grow on their own when the conditions are right, if we have good fall ear, uh, rainfall. So if we have, especially October, November period, if we get some good rains, then they germinate. They just kind of hang out with whatever rains they get. They grow when they can, they sit there when they, if it's dry, but then, you know, they'll uh, hopefully get enough rain that they grow enough and, and put on a beautiful flower display for you in the spring. Then it starts warming up, they go to seed, drop those seeds. Those seeds are still alive. They're just little seeds. They're hiding on the ground. They're going to wait till things get good again. And so, uh, so that's how they are void. Of course, your cactus, typical, you know, obviously they're storing water for later. They're doing like the reservoirs. They're like, let's hold on to it for now. And then when it dries up, we'll be able to tap into that moisture that we stored up. And even the saguaros, the pleats will expand and contract depending on how much moisture they have. There's things like um, endurers, these, the ocotillo, they, they have the strategy of, you know, they will leaf out when things are great. And the ocotillos look like little pipe cleaners right now, right? They can, most of them are just beautiful. They poofed out because of the rains. Um, and then when it dries up, they drop those leaves. They're still alive and uh, they'll just wait for things to get good. Well, I mentioned Palo Verde, the green stick. The beautiful adaptation Palo Verdes have is that they can drop their leaves if they need to and still photosynthesize from that stem. That stem has chlorophyll. They're able to make food for themselves and that's a super ad adaptation for a tree. There's very, I, I think there's maybe one or two other trees that do that, it's very unusual. And then things like creosote have those real resinous uh, tacky kind of leaves that will uh, that helps them hold moisture in. That's that's when when it rains. When we say the desert smells like rain. That's that's uh, usually that that aroma that we get as creosote. And then I showed this at the beginning. Just those silvery leaves. A lot of our desert plants have those very uh, lighter colored leaves or hairs on their leaves to help protect them from the summer sun. Um, I had a class one time. I guess the guy's name was Jeff Rice. Somehow I got his name, <laughs> and and he said. I just want to know what will and will not grow here. And so he's like, that's a great question. And that's what we want to emphasize is that, we're, that the plants we're showing are plants that are adapted to this region. They're native to the desert, Sonoran Desert or other deserts uh, around the world uh, the, from Australia or Africa and those kinds of things. Now, again, I'm from the Northeast originally. I love my hostas. I, I just had to look, get over that, you know, there's just certain things and it's amazing what you can grow here if you want to put enough energy into it, you know, like people grow our gardenias, even though gardenias like acid soils and our soils are very basic and people will pour on this acid type fertilizers and stuff, but I don't want to put all that energy into it and, and, and uh, I don't know if you could ever grow a hosta here. <laughs> so you can't do certain things. Uh, this is just, this is a, a interesting little diagram. It's called the, the death spiral. And it's, and it's talking about um, what might cause death in a plant. And you'll, you'll see that as it's here on the outside area, this is the most common reasons why plants die. And as you get closer to the inner circle, it's like the least known reasons why the plants die. So unknown factors, it's like, yeah, th then they just don't know. Old age is here, air pollution and that kind of stuff. Perfect but you, can, Good. But you, can, plan. you, you can, have a plan. You have a plan. You can see. Anyway. Hey, Caroline, can you mute, please? Oh, and so sorry. you can see that uh, plants that are not adapted to the area are um, is the biggest reason that plants don't survive. Then you have, you know, then you have the poor soil conditions or soil problems and all that. You'll see that soil compaction, but insects and diseases is way in this inner spiral. Usually the plants get stressed first and then those other things move in. So ma majority of the plant problems is selecting the wrong plants. So hopefully I've talked you into selecting these plants because they give us a wonderful sense of place that we're in the Sonoran Desert, that we're in this unique 
environment and climate, um, that you want to add color and interest and things that are good for the wildlife and butterflies and those kinds of things. And we can replace some of the habitat that gets lost by all of our construction. And then just because there's some amazing plants that are available to us that we can uh, grow and, and, and enjoy. Um, so selecting plants, I just want a quick little uh, tutorial on plant names. So we, when we do talk about plants, we try to give you the scientific name because there's a lot of common names out there. So people might have different common names for the same plant. So if we go by the scientific name, then we know we're getting the correct plant. And so this is an example of a plant name that might be listed, Ruralia bretoniana, and then it has a little Katie on the end. And so Katie Ruralia is the common name. The Ruralia is the genus uh, of that plant. So there's one or more species of plants that share that kind of those characteristics. Then the species names, species name um, is gives that that it's uh, a little lot more specific, right, to, to that plant. And then the, so so again, Katie was the common name. Um, and then this is a, actually a specific cultivar, and that's why it has that little extra name on the end, and, and it might be a trademark plant, and so you might see things like that. So this gives an example, you know, purple lilac fine is the common name, but what we told you to look for is Hardenbergia violaceae, and so hopefully you found that, and then the happy wanderer is that particular cultivated variety that that nursery might grow. Uh, so, but the warning is, unfortunately, the botanists are out there doing all this genetic stuff now, and they're deciding to change some of these names. <laughs> so it's unfortunate now the scientific names have changed as well. So just keep that in mind. But these are just showing different labels at different nurseries, and uh, you get the idea that, uh, that, you know, the common name and scientific names are typically listed. Uh, when you're selecting at the nursery, make sure the plant's not oversized for the container. Very tempting. It's like, let me get the biggest plant in the pot. A lot of times that means that you've got circling roots and it's root bound or, you know, too many roots and it's going to kind of never be able to grow out of that, especially your trees. So make sure you're careful of that. Uh, just look for damage or root or pest problems uh, and make sure it just appears healthy. Um, how can you tell? You may not always be able to tell if you go buy a plant when it's a little bit dormant, it might not look so great, but you can ask the nursery and they can let you know if maybe it's just dormant and it's still okay to purchase it and it's still healthy or whatever. Um, and sometimes you might want them to even show you, dump out the pot for you so you can look at the roots and they will often be very gracious about doing that. Uh, we also recommend Arizona Grown is best. So if you can do the local nurseries that, you know, the, some of the big box stores often will get, they, sometimes they get local plants too, but sometimes they get plants from California. And plants that are grown locally are going to just perform better once they're out in your landscape because they already have been adapted to the climate. So uh, this is actually good. It's not too root bound. You might still want to tickle some of these roots before it's planted. Uh, we don't want to really tear up the root ball obviously, but uh, we don't want uh, just a big mat. So this is just real basics. When you're planting a tree, this is again another interpretive sign we had at Mesa Community College. Um, you never want to dig the hole deeper than the root ball. So that's something that to, to uh, look at the, the, the size of the root ball and only dig that deep. Now what's good if you can do it and if you've got the, the muscle behind it and a pick and an ax maybe is to loosen the soil at least two to three times around where that where that plant's going to be planted um, and then you know just put it in you put the native soil back in in place you don't add amendments but then we do recommend a mulch layer on top um, here's a here's an example uh, of doing all that um, and and adding adding mulch to the surface, not in the backfill, and uh, making sure you don't get the mulch too close to it, you know, keep it four to six inches away from the trunk and so forth. So, uh, and, and when we talk about mulching on top, we also wanna encourage you to leave litter. This is uh, Foot, Foothills Palo Verde here in my backyard. And this was in the spring when it had dropped all those flowers. Leave those beautiful flowers. They look beautiful on the tree. And I love that they look so beautiful on the ground as well. Uh, you can also get this service called Chip Drop. If you just uh, get chipdrop.com, chip I 
could not say that 10 times real fast. And this was an example, somebody that got some in, in Mesa. I think they're trying to save this tree, this pine tree. Uh, the, the, the tree service is out doing chipping, shredding, pruning, that kind of stuff, maybe removing trees that goes to the chipper shredder. If you sign up on this app that you say, hey, you can drop them off at my house before you take them, instead of taking them to the dump, they'll do that. Now, it's not for everyone. They dump the whole load. There might be other little things in there you got to pick out. There's a great video that Chip Drop has done, and I've got that link on that site um, that you should watch if you want to consider that. But again, this is this is Chip Drop material that we put in our landscape at Mesa Urban Garden uh, area in the front bed, and you can see that this is pal this is beautiful desert willow flowers that drop, and it's like it looks beautiful. We don't have to worry about raking that up. Okay, let's get into some plants. So when it comes to um, trees, or they're gonna provide the greatest impact, provide permanent structure, the best shade, uh, but again, being careful with placement. And, and I suggest having a certified arborist work on your trees or just get very knowledgeable yourself about how to prune. This feather bush, Lysoloma watsoni, is a wonderful tree, one of my favorites, uh, thornless, and just provides beautiful shade uh, and, and I just think it looks so lush. I think it's beautiful for the desert. This one uh, is used a lot because it's a great little small tree. It's tough. It's from Australia. Um, so it does provide you some shade and for small spaces, Acacia and Nura. Um, the Palo Blanco, the one that I read you the, the story about the, the bark. <laughs> and this actually was in my backyard one year. I swear this, this morning glory was ran. I didn't plant it. It just came up. It wrapped itself around that bark. It was fantastic. Um, and, and they're technically morning glories are considered a noxious weed here, but I think they just took the, the ornamental one off the list. But again, just a nice small wispy tree and provides you only 10 foot in width. So it's really great for those narrow side yards. Uh, this one, the Cascalodi is evergreen. It provides you shade and winter color. So it's going to start blooming again in Boy, sometimes November, uh, December, January is when you'll see the blooms on this. And it really has this beautiful leaf. Uh, it has the really pretty spikes of yellow flowers. It has this fantastic bark that I love. It's like these cat claw rose, almost like a rose bush type thorn. But um, there's, a, there's a cultivar out there now called Smoothie that does not have that. So you can get it thornless as well. Blue Palo Verde, Parkinsonia. Uh, Florida used to, um, again, just a, a, a beautiful native tree that we have. And you can see, again, that beautiful litter on the ground in the foothills, Palo Verde. These are the ones that you'll see on the mountains. They look like just big bushes. They're on the rocky slopes. So you can tell just by that that they're very drought tolerant. Desert Willow, one of my favorites, favorite, favorite, favorite. Deciduous uh, summer shade, spring and it's, it's bloom spring through fall, attracts incredible wildlife, uh, hummingbirds, bees, all kinds of things. Uh, all different colors and shades of flowers that are available. This is a cultivar called Bubba. I really like it because it's nice, small shape. This is at the park and ride here in Mesa. Uh, and again, that seasonal shade, here you go. Winter months, this is what it looks like. So keep that in mind. If you're using something like this, you don't want this to be the focal point maybe in your yard, or if it is, maybe put other things that'll be blooming when it's not, so that it's not the focal point, I guess. And so again, this would have been better maybe in front of the window where it would have had that benefit, but um, you can see it, they go deciduous, man. But they leaf out very quickly in the spring. This is just a fun little plant, Scrubine mesquite. Really unusual. I just wanted to show that it's a fun one to do. But then this is the native mesquite as well. And so the velvet mesquite. And the, that's the one where you can eat the, you know, grind up the pods and everything. Your shrubs add form, texture, a lot of that seasonal impact with the colors. Uh, and it, don't shear them. Allow them to grow natural. Please, 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 if you can. I know it's, it's rarely done, especially in commercial landscapes. Uh, so Texas sages are wonderful. You've seen those just bursting into bloom with these rains that we've had. Um, this is a fun one called flame honeysuckle. Doesn't You don't see this around much, but it's one of my favorites for good uh, late spring and early summer color. Um, woolly butterfly bush, as you can imagine, attracts butterflies. Uh, so just a fun, very gray, very light colored plant, very tough. Um, the red bird of paradise, there's a yellow selection. You didn't know that. So when you do decide on these plants, start researching or talking to the nurseries if they have these special cultivars. A lot of nurseries are doing more specialty cultivars of our desert plant. This, of course, is the typical red bird. 
and this is the yellow selection. Fairy dusters, again, a beautiful favorite plant. We have the native one, which is pink. This one is the pink one, attracts hummingbirds. You wouldn't believe that there's nectar in there, but there must be because they sure work that plant. Little leaf cordias and big leaf cordias. Uh, the brittle bush I've shown you, they, again, the wild birds and everything love this plant. Chuparosas, hummingbirds will fight over this one. So a, a great plant um, to put in the yard. Creosote, I just think is just a tough, great plant. And then the sage, throw and sage again, just uh, a different type of sage, but just uh, beautiful. Mangle dulce is just a great green plant. So this is one of those that I've highlighted in my green article. It, it's, it may not give you lots of other color, but it's great green color. And then just white plumblago, it does well in, in some shade. So this is actually a shade plant. Ruelias, wonderful, for this purple color that you can get. Texas mountain laurel. I mentioned that earlier with the, the scent. Uh, the orange bells and yellow bells, fantastic plants uh, and lots of color. Uh, succulents, they provide drama and sculpture. Make sure you don't overwater them. This is the smooth agave. Uh, and when it comes to agaves, look at this full size, two by two, but this one's six by six. So this agave here, the Weber's really can get large. It might be small when you purchase it, but it gets very big. The aloes are typically from, uh, they're, well, they're from the African continent, but they do so well here. They attract hummingbirds, but there's so many different aloes. Just make sure you check them out. And the desert milkweed. Here we go again with that desert milkweed and uh, the butterflies. One, the one with the yellow. What was the one with the yellow? That that's aloe. the medicinal aloe. Okay. Yep. And so that's the one that you can use for sunburns and things like that. So the milkweed attracts both the queen butterfly and then the monarch butterfly. So they're great for that as well. Slipper flower is a great little succulent that gets these bright red flowers and is so heat. Oh, just loves the heat. And then if you're going to use grass to stay away from fountain grass, make sure you use our deer grass and other natives that we have that do beautifully here. The vines, you'll get good vertical dimension. Uh, it's great for small gardens or tight spots. Um, oh, my queen's wreath, I didn't get in there. Uh, there's one called lilac vine, uh, the pink trumpet vine, which blooms really nicely in the late summer. Uh, and then add flowers. It just adds such a nice, um, you know, uh, just charm, adds charm. This is Blackfoot Daisy, one of my favorites. Always plant this in your yard if you can. The evening primrose is great. Those big white flowers and it'll attract moths. Just be careful with this pink one because that one can, can spread in your yard. If you like bulbs, the, we have this rain lily and it does really well. And again, it tends to bloom best when we have rains. And of course, just getting this is my backyard, the wildflower seed out there. Uh, maintenance, and I know I'm out of time. Um, I'm gonna just blow through this and with the idea that you guys can see these um, on, the, on the presentation, but just with watering, get the book and go to our website and you're gonna learn a lot about the details of proper watering just deeply and infrequently is what we stress to, to let the, you know, the soil dry out in between and you'll water more deeply for trees than you will for the smaller plants, shrubs and ground ground covers. Make sure you're checking your timers and I hope you have them all turned on rain off or turned off to the rain or stop setting and just making sure you're checking those for breaks and dog damage and stuff like that and make sure you're rainwater harvesting. We've got lots of great information about rainwater harvesting uh, and with weed control we've, we've uh, just make sure you're going out there and just pulling the weeds out when they're when the ground's wet. It's real easy to do and then proper pruning is just really critical as well. We don't want to do this to our plants. We don't want to cut off the flowers from these plants that we're growing for their color um, and uh, is sometimes it stresses them so much. So just let them shine, you know. This was some of those uh, yellow bells or the Tacomas. And just look at what they did when they sheared it. It's like, oh, come on, this was so beautiful. And they sold the house and this is what the new owners did. Uh, and then fertilize, you don't need it with a lot of these desert plants. So just uh, only fertilize if you absolutely need to, because many of our desert plants or legumes and fix their own nitrogen, they don't need it. So resources we have available, the book, the plants book I showed you that has these charts in there, but we have the online version and you can do searches and you can do all kinds of things with the amwa.org plants. Water use it wisely. We have this uh, plan of the month feature and you can find that uh, at wateruseitwisely.com. And we have all these books available. I'll, I give you the links to order those. 
The watering guide has an online version as well. So that's available. Visit gardens because you'll get some great ideas by visiting demonstration gardens. And I have to just a real quick shout out to the Monarch Cave and Reading Sanctuary at Red Mountain Library. We installed this a year ago, uh, early in the spring of 2020. We were going to have a big grand opening and it got canceled because of COVID. Um, and so this volunteers that built um, a beautiful labyrinth there. Uh, this talks just had some signage, people enjoying it already after we installed it. And this is the labyrinth you know, just uh, represents a journey to your own center and back out into the world. It has beautiful paths. Um, we've had uh, three other classes besides today's class. All the videos are available on that link we're going to send you. So they'll be available on YouTube. So please make sure you check on that. And again, this is the same slide I, I showed you at the beginning. And it has uh, that link. Uh, all these will be links for you. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry I went late again, <laughs> but I still would be, I'm, I will be glad to take questions if Stephanie's uh, uh, has time to do it as well. And anybody that needs to sign off, we understand. But that'll be on the uh, recording if you do miss it. Yes, we, Donna, we had a couple of questions. Okay. Uh, one was about a person who keeps transplanting things and they keep dying on her. Okay. Um, well, and, yeah, go ahead. She's just wondering why, what might be going on. So I don't know. It's, it, and that's a tough one. It could be a uh, plant, just the plant selection. Sometimes it can be a matter of just soil compaction. It might be a matter of planting at the wrong time of the year. Um, so it could be a lot of reasons and, and it might take a little more detective work. So again, if by, by, by trying those plants that are really tough, that is your best first start. But uh, we might have to investigate. Sometimes, you know, there might be, there's some herbicides out there that are sold at the big box stores right as you're going out. They're called uh, ground clear. And um, I can't think of the active ingredient. Be really careful with any herbicides that are going to, that say that they'll keep weeds from growing for months. What that does is it stays persistent in our desert soils. It isn't as persistent in other parts of the country and uh, it should not be sold here, but it is. So sometimes if somebody prior to her living in that home could have put something like ground clear on and you can, I, you know, I, we can talk offline. I can give her a couple little, uh, little tests she can do by growing like corn or beans in a pot with the soil out there and see if there's trouble with it growing. So anything else? Uh, yes. Someone just asked if the plants that you're showing need to be watered in the summertime. Probably. Now, <laughs> We had this fantastic monsoon. This is what the monsoons are supposed to be like, right? So, you know, we, we actually have some brochures that talk about landscape uh, plants for natural rainfall. And what you can do is when you're going through the book, we have uh, on the chart, we have the little water um, requirement. Everything in here is low water use, but if, it, if the water drop is completely empty, then it's really you know, really drought tolerant. If it has a tiny bit of water at the bottom of the water drop, then it's, 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 it's pretty, pretty drought tolerant. And then if it has a, you know, it's like half full of water, then it's moderately drought tolerant. Um, and so, so pick those things that are especially native to the Sonoran Desert, or those things that show that they're extremely drought tolerant. And what you can do is sometimes people even put just a temporary irrigation system in, they might even lay it on the surface of the ground instead of putting it underground. They might use something like soaker hoses and you can get your plants established and then they should be able to live on natural rainfall. Now, the difference is, you know, when you look at the desert and I told you about those adaptations, you know, trees and some plants will have branch dieback to tolerate the dry conditions. So if you want the plants to look a little bit nicer than that, then you have to provide some supplemental irrigation. Uh, but if we get enough rains, then you're golden and, and they should be able to survive, especially if they're native plants. So good question. Okay, uh, someone asking if there are plants to avoid if you're prone to allergies. Yes. That's another good question. So there are, again, the, the, the booklet will talk about plants that are especially uh, causing issues with, with, you know, with allergens. 
Um, there's, there are certain things. Typically, the plants that cause the biggest allergy problems are the ones with very insignificant flowers. If you think about it, it makes sense. A, a flower, a plant that has a flower that's both scented and either scented and or very attractive has, has evolved and designed itself to get nature to help pollinate it. So it's attracting the bees, it's attracting the birds, it's attracting bats that'll come in and feed and then pollinate. It's the plants that don't have that 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 actually do what's what's called air, you know, just uh, air pollination. And so they have very, very extremely fine pollen that they just push out so that it's windborne and it'll hopefully travel to another plant. If you think about, again, that also makes sense that the really fine pollen is gonna make the worst issue for a human being because it's more likely to get into our nasal cavity and cause the problems that they cause. So those are things to, to, to watch for, uh, typically look at, look at that, uh, look up the plant for what, if it is an allergen, especially if you have that problem. Now there's certain things that are no longer allowed to be grown here, like the olive trees. There's a fruitless olive that is considered to be allergen free uh, that you can purchase instead of the regular olive. So all, you know, olive trees can cause a great deal of, of uh, allergen problems here. And if you think about it, what have you ever seen olive trees blooming? No, because they get these little teeny bitty tiny white flowers that you, you, you know, it's just insignificant. You don't see them. So people always blame citrus and the, um, uh, what is it? The uh, blah, 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 acacias, because they're blooming in the spring. And it's typically these other plants, a lot of mulberries and other things that are the allergens during that time of year. And these other poor plants that are blooming get the get the rap for it so keep that in mind okay um someone asked if there's if the, you need to irrigate the creosote bushes that's another good question i <laughs> i've once it's established you can definitely stop irrigating creosote now, what you're going to see, and what I think is amazing about them, is they do respond. You've seen it right now with the rains. If you if you drive, I was just up on uh, 51, up in Dreamy Draw area, and you, the, the creosote there just looked fantastic. To me, a creosote when it gets when it gets a little extra moisture, it looks like a juniper bush or something. They get real beefy. They get dark green, um, and so they look beautiful. Now, if they don't have some of that supplemental moisture and it's really hot and dry, then they kind of they kind of you know get a little more airy and wispy and a little bit yellow green color to them. So it just depends on what you're looking for. But I've got uh, we planted a. a creosote for screen along our driveway and now I keep having some coming up from seed and there's one that's just you know has no irrigation and it's doing great so okay uh another question when is the best time to plant the yellow bells can they be planted in the summer or should you wait till fall that's it, it that's another good question this time of year to plant spring and fall are great times of year to plant and kind of the kind of the general tips would be um, that those are the most forgiving times, the spring and fall. Fall is probably the very best time for most plants because you're planting when the soil's still warm, but it, the conditions are cooler. They're a lot more forgiving. There's, there's less chance that you're just going to lose the whole root ball because you forgot to water one day or the water system broke down. So for that reason, it's a really good time. Now, if it's a really cold sensitive plant, even like a citrus fall may not be the best time or something like hibiscus because they're frost sensitive. Those probably are better in the spring. So anything that has a little issue with cold, plant them in the spring. But technically all of our desert plants grow they're doing a lot of their growth in the summer, they will get established quickly. If you plant them, even in the middle of summer, it's just less forgiving. It's just that you've got to be so careful about your watering and making sure you're giving it enough water. And you might have to put shade cloth over it in the summer just to get it, uh, give it a little bit of a break while it's getting established. That's a real good idea for a lot of plants that are a little more sensitive. And I've had a couple plants that I did that for the first two years or that I lost it the first year and I tried it again and put shade on it and got it to get through. And now they're doing great. They just needed to get established. So Okay, one more question is about black plastic in your landscape. 
good question. Great questions from this group. And I'm sorry <laughs> we ended up late. Uh, black plastic is not recommended at all. No, 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 no plastic <laughs> because <laughs> It's going to keep all the rain from getting to your plants. This is the best water you can get for your plants. It doesn't have all the salts in it that our rivers have. I mean, our river water, our surface water, I should say, not rivers, but our, our municipal water has that. And um, the, the, there's something more about, you know, first of all, if you have lightning, that fixes some of the nitrogen. You actually get a little nitrogen bath on your plants with uh, when we have uh, lightning and thunderstorms. So it's going to give it a little bit of nu nutrients. And there's all kinds of enzymes and stuff. Like there's minerals that come down in the rainwater that are so good for your plants. I have tried many times when I started my wildflower seeds to try watering them to germinate them. Nothing would happen. Nothing would happen. As soon as that rainwater came in, poof, you know, it, it's just something magical about it. So you always want to be able to collect that rainwater. And we've got a great page on wiseley.com on rainwater harvesting. It gives you all the details and it gives you links to get to more information. And the other problem with putting black plastic is it's going to be sheeting off water. And you've seen all these this flooding we've had. The more water we can absorb into the landscapes, the better. A lot of the cities are doing these curb cuts now and they're getting water into the you know, uh, landscapes and especially for the trees, it provides multiple benefits. It waters the trees, it cleans the storm water, it helps recharge our groundwater aquifers. So yes, please don't use black plastic. Now, if you're concerned about weeds, you can use landscape fabrics and they're more expensive but they're gonna allow the water to penetrate and go through and oxygen exchange and all that can happen. So that's a better way to go, but I don't even like to use those just because they get in your way when you're having to dig and stuff like that. The plastic will start to come to the surface. Weeds will still grow on top of the granite. Psh, don't do it, don't do it. Hope I convinced you. Okay, what, what should they do? Should they remove the plastic then? I would. Yeah. Okay. as much as you can and it can be hard but i would yes yep um all right one more question are there any vines that do not have flowers yes yes there's a really nice again they probably have little insignificant flowers which could make them a little bit allergenic but i i've never heard of it being a problem it's called grape ivy or cissus trifoliata here let me get to uh uh, let me go ahead and yeah. Uh, and so it's just a really nice little green vine. I'm just trying to see if there's any others that we've listed here. I don't think so. Uh, I, I'm not gonna be able to see it. It's in the book, but it's 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 it is called grape ivy. It has a very very much that uh, grape uh, leaf shape, and so it's just a really nice and it's nice for partly shade areas and it will grow very nicely on a trellis. We have a, a beautiful specimen of one at Dobson Ranch Library that we put in and it went crazy over there. Man, it grew well. And it attracts some of the uh, butterflies and moths that will come to feed on the leaves too. So it's a good, it's, uh, we planted it because it was a butterfly plant. Good question. Okay, and what is the name of that book? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's Landscape Plants for the yes. Arizona Desert. It's available. Oh, tell them, Stephanie. Yes, it's available at the library <laughs> along with the uh, watering guide and the Xeriscape information as well. So come to the library and pick those books up. We make them available to you for free. Uh, most of the nurseries will also carry them. We provide them to them and we have them. Like I said, the link will provide you the place where you can order them online and we'll actually mail it to you. So. And then there's the online version, just say landscape plants uh, online and you'll, you'll find it there. And what's nice about, we haven't updated the book yet. Um, we got all new photos of the plant pictures from this uh, professional photographer. And those are the ones that are online. So there's some really beautiful pictures online. So. And how many times a year does a brittle bush flower? I think only once. Yeah, I think just in the spring, early spring, it might be you'd get a second bloom out of it if it if with the rains, you know, sometimes I've noticed like my penstemons, I think with these rains, they got a little confused. They're like, I think we're going to bloom again. And they sent up a few shoots. So it could be depending on the weather. But, but typically it's that real early spring, uh, February through about April bloom period. 
And again, leave the seeds on. We get these goldfinch, I forget what, if they're goldfinch, but they're something that's unusual here that we don't usually, we only see seasonally and the birds will come in and they land on those flowers, those delicate flowers, and they'll bounce down to the ground because the flower get, gets weighed down and then they just pick at those, uh, uh, the, the seed heads. So great for birds. Okay, well, thank you very much, Donna, for answering all those questions and for your wonderful presentation as always. And um, everybody will get a copy of the recording, everyone that's registered. And then you'll see all the information that you probably didn't have time to get answered today. So <laughs> Donna has that um, bit.ly website and you can look at that for a lot of the information. And thank you. I'm seeing a lot of thank yous on the chat. Thank you very much. I really, really do appreciate that too. That, uh, that uh, you found it useful and and definitely, you know, you're always welcome to reach out to me if you have uh, personal questions. I'll be glad to answer. All right, thanks again, everyone. Thanks for coming. And um, thanks to Donna, our, our wonderful expert on plants. Thanks to the library too. Yes. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Everybody right. have a good afternoon. Enjoy the rain and the summer. Yes, yes. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And we're out. Bye.